break. Hurry, Mr. Bergeron's on. Don't forget the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. Healthcare proxies. I just always say, remember Terry Schiavo. I know Terry Schiavo was a long time ago now, but remember that case, the woman in the vegetative state? And you've got the divorced husband fighting with the parents of the woman regarding whether or not to pull the plug. Went for years, went to the Supreme Court, it was this big, huge thing. All would have been avoided if Terry Schiavo had done a healthcare proxy and had actually named somebody as the person able to make her medical decisions for you. So why do you do one? You avoid that problem. You help your doctor sleep better, because the worst thing you can do to a doctor is have you incapacitated in a coma and have a couple of your kids, and one of them is saying, oh, I think we ought to do this, and the other one is saying, oh, I think we ought to do that. And what the doctor is saying is, well, wait a minute, I'm not figuring this out, right? Go get a probate court order, right? That's exactly what you don't want, because when your doctor is worried, then he's just going to step back or she's going to step back, and you're going to be stuck in the probate court. Um, it's also going to reduce family fights. If you say, if you've designated somebody as your attorney, then you've made it clear also to your other children that you've designated somebody. By the way, you can't have more than one proxy at the same time. You can have an individual who's going to serve as the proxy, and you can have an alternate, but you can't have co-proxies. Just to avoid the problem I just described, the doctor does not need to hear two different people making two different decisions. Next slide. Um, the proxy, as opposed to your power of attorney, which is good when you've signed it, unless there's this piece that says that it's a springing power of attorney, the proxy only takes effect when, quote, and this is from the law, the principal lacks the capacity to make or communicate health care decisions, unquote, and the attending physician has to have certified that and has to have done it in writing. Next slide. Uh, when does the proxy stop? Well, even though the doctor has made that certification for you at a particular moment, at any moment after that, the doctor can certify that you've regained your capacity, at which point the healthcare proxy stops until you subsequently, until you later lose your capacity if you do. So it always stops if the doctor is certified you've regained your capacity. It also stops if you decide to revoke it, and you can revoke it at any time. So ironically, while if you're in this kind of situation and they, you know, so there's the there's the doctor and there's the, you know, and, 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 the, and the, there's your proxies and, and there's going to be and a procedure, and the proxy says, yes, do the procedure. And you say, oh, I don't want that procedure. And the doctor says, no, I have to listen to the proxy because you know, you're not capable of, medic of making a medical decision. If instead you say, you're fired to the proxy, that's valid. No matter how crazy you are, you can always get rid of your proxy. Now, that seems like a weird rule, but it was one of those things that the legislature had to decide. You know, you had to decide in, this, in these kinds of situations so where, where are we going to err? And, and the decision was, we're going to err in favor of the individual, right, who was actually the person who gave the proxy. So if there's any question about keeping that individual's rights, we're going to keep them. And that's why they kept the rule that way. Next slide. Uh, finally, do not resuscitate orders. Remember, you can't just do one of those yourself and just kind of write it out. A do not resuscitate order needs to be signed by the doctor, right? Because it's really an order from a doctor to a medical person who is not a doctor saying, this is the medical order. Don't resuscitate this person. You typically will have assented to that. Um, as a matter of fact, you need to have assented to it using the official form that Massachusetts has. Your doctor can't kind of sign you away on his own. Um, but the main thing about a do not resuscitate order is remember, keep it in a very conspicuous place like on the refrigerator, which is where the, the EMT is expecting to see it if you've dropped on the floor in your, in, in your house. Because when the EMT is walking in the door, and so he sees you on the floor, and he's gonna make a decision right then, right? So now I can't wait till the hospital now, because you're not breathing. And it's, am I gonna resuscitate that person or not? And, he, and he's saying to himself, or she, right? If I, if I don't resuscitate this person, I got nothing but trouble, right? Because my job is to resuscitate this person, right? So I'm going to look for this, 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 you know, this DNR really quickly, and if I don't find it, I'm resuscitating that person, right? Um, so you want to make sure if you've got one of these that it's in a very public place. This is the reason why most people have done these typically when they went to the hospital, 
right? The hospital, that's one of the things they'll ask you, is if while you're here, you lose consciousness, do you want to be resuscitated? But that's how to deal with it if you're at home. Finally, remember that's the goal of all of this. The goal of all of this is to sleep well at night. But I guess I would expand that in this case to say, the goal of this is to help you sleep well at night and also to help your kids sleep well at night. So by doing this kind of planning ahead of time, you're kind of helping everybody with these issues. Thank you very much.